Uh, oh, thank you very much, Alan, Christoph, and Paul, for organizing this and for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's good that I'm starting uh, this day rather than going at the end because last night's, last, yesterday's talks were very good and very intimidating, so it's nice to go up first in the day. Um, so I tried to follow Alan's email to the T and follow instructions, so I'm sort of putting myself out there a bit. Uh, but I hope that by embarrassing myself, I'll be able to uh, get some new collaborators as we go ahead. So uh, I think even before I begin, if I just had three minutes to give this talk, I have only three messages to convey. First one was conveyed several times yesterday that cell types, understanding cell types in the brain are important. But the second message I want to convey is that let's take an orthogonal view of how to understand cell types by just trying to make them in vitro in a dish. So if we make cell types, can we help solve the problem in a completely different way. And the second message I want to convey is that cell types are often defined by their expression patterns, by measuring the amount of RNA, protein modifications, and so on and so forth. But they arise from progenitor cells. And as I've been looking, as we've been looking in my lab more and more at the data and some experiments, we find that maybe the rules governing how progenitor cells differentiate into the different cell types might actually be simpler to look at than actual expression patterns. So the answers look simpler. So the question is, should we be looking at developmental time series as these cell types arise and looking at the rules that are used by the cells to give rise to the different cell types? So maybe the answers are simpler. Um, and I've been involved with the cell networks project, so my talk is somewhat influenced by um, what we're trying to do there. <coughs> so just to step back a bit, if you have an organism, or any organism really, and we're going to be looking at single cells as a function of time, the environment changes. And here is a cartoon of the environment over time. And there is some ugly network inside the cell. And in, because of this network, the cell is capable of responding to this environment. So the green curve is the response of the cell in some uh, space as a function of time. Every so often, something interesting happens, where the response, rather than being single y value, suddenly breaks up into some number of possible options. Um, and the cell has to, so the network first has to allow the cell some number of options instead of it being a continuum. And secondly, the cell has to choose between these options. And once it chooses between the options, how it interprets the environment thereafter is changed. There are several examples of this happening. Uh, um, bacterial and fungal cells in response to starvation or stress enter stress-resistant states. Initially, they respond continuously, but suddenly there's something that happens to the network. It breaks. Cells go into a different state. Um, the second example, which I'll be focusing on today, is the fate choice of cells during development. Repeatedly during development, cells have to listen to signals, listen to their surroundings, and choose between multiple fates. And another example was mentioned yesterday, which are behavioral decisions, which we also look at, which I won't talk about. But how do you make decisions in terms of, say, turning left or right? What are the underlying circuits? And I want to make one point clear by what I mean by understanding. I want to understand these circuits just enough to be able to force my will on the circuits. What are the buttons that we can push in this mess to make the cell do what we want to? And if we can't do that, then we don't understand. But I don't need to understand all the mechanistic details. So I'm just asking for the softest buttons in this network that I can press. So again, going back to sort of uh, more specific questions, how do the underlying circuits afford the cell discrete choices? How does the cell or the organism choose between these options? Is there a little more than mechanics? So if I have a ball rolling down the hill and there are bumps on the road, it sort of follows along a valley. Now, if I start shaking the landscape, the question is, is it just Newtonian mechanics with chaos, in which case the ball just rolls down whatever mechanics dictates, in which case saying that the ball makes a decision is kind of stupid. But the more interesting thing is, if I start shaking the landscape and the ball suddenly says, I'm going to defy gravity, just stop here and listen for a bit more before I go down a valley, that will be interesting. In our experiments, we find that single cells are actually capable of doing that. They just stay put if you try to confuse them. And finally, are there common principles that govern computations inside cells and computations by nervous systems? If you think about it, you make decisions because you're predicting what the environment is going to be like next. And bacteria and fungi and single cell organisms are faced by complex environments. And to think that the circuits inside them that make these computations might have similar principles that neural circuits use might not be that far-fetched. And looking at both systems simultaneously might be interesting. So it is with this viewpoint that I want to start looking at how the different neurons in the brain arise. So 
the question again in terms of the cell networks project is to ask what are the series of cell fate choices that cells make to lead to the cell types in the brain. In this cartoon, and I don't have a pointer on me, but I don't think I need one, uh, the embryonic cells are shown on the leftmost end in the golden color. I have to figure out what to press, which is, oh, there. So uh, they land up becoming two kinds of cells initially. Mesendodermal progenitor cells and neuroelectrodermal progenitor cells that give rise to your entire body. These neuroelectrodermal progenitor cells then give rise to your skin, but they also give rise in the embryo to the nervous system. They differentiate further the whole series of fate transitions, which we don't know about. And they first give rise to the neural tube. The neural tube falls over, does all sorts of funky stuff, and uh, eventually you get the brain. And it's very interesting geometry here. But the question is, what are the fate transitions that the cells are making as they go from here to there? And are there general rules we can discover by understanding who the circuits are controlling the fate transitions as opposed to describing the actual cell type? So how does one determine uh, the series of decisions? The Allen Brain Institute has beautiful data where one has gene expression patterns in a developing brain. Again, it would be very good if they went further back in time and got more data and also got transcriptional uh, markers for some of the earlier developmental time series. But this data that they have is already extremely useful. Uh, so the question is, can we look at this data and somehow make guesses of what the circuits are that are making the fit choices? And as I said before, I have a very clear definition of understanding. I don't care precisely how all the details work out. I just want to force an understand, I want to force a decision if I want to. So which points in the circuit do I press? So, so, so sort of approach one might think of taking, and I'll tell you what the challenges are. One is to build and analyze sort of a directory of gene expression pattern in a developing brain. We already have a directory. And the question is, how do you analyze this directory to see what the rules are that make the brain? And the second thing I want to say is we should take an orthogonal approach where we just start generating cells of the brain from embryonic stem cells. This is because we get an, very different kinds of techniques coming in to understand how these cells operate. We have better access to them, and they land up becoming very specific cell types in a dish, as I'll show you. So here is the neural tube that I showed you. The question is, can we take embryonic stem cells and make them into progenitor cells on different points on this neural tube? We really don't understand how they make these choices of becoming progenitor cells of this region versus that region versus that region. But in a dish now, from published literature just this year, we already know how to take these cells and make them into progenitor cells that lie in that region and progenitor cells that lie in that region. And this is the optic cup that gives rise to the retina. So if you just take ES cells and make them into progenitor cells that lie in that region, which are the dorsal forebrain progenitors, and just let them go in a dish, they automatically give rise to the pyramidal neurons of the neocortex. They first give rise to the deep layers of the neocortex. This is pictures of images from a great postdoc Adele Doyle in the lab. And you can see these neurons coming out, and they belong to the deep layers because we know the gene expression pattern. And after that, temporarily, they give rise to layers three and four. So in a dish, we can get these neurons. And in fact, if you make ventral forebrain cells, you can get the inhibitory interneurons that come up too. And the nice thing is that the thing in the dish is a mess. There are lots of different cell types. Most of the stuff, we don't know what they are. But if we believe that they belong to some part of the brain, then we have an enormous advantage because suddenly we can use very serious statistics and Bayesian analysis to exploit this heterogeneity in a dish and ask, why did this cell do A and that cell do B? What's different about them? And how far back along the road were they different? And when did they first branch out? So getting lineage trees in a dish is exceptionally easy. And that, I think, we can exploit to find out what circuits are making the decision. And here is another remarkable example where people just made progenitor cells of the optic cup. And I'm sure all of you have seen this. They just put it in three-dimensional culture. And the form thing forms an optic cup with retinal epithelium inside. And it's hard to imagine that it's not recapitulating something that happens in the embryo. And it gives us an enormously so a spectacular example where we have access to these cells. We can look in, we can see what they do in time. And so the question again is, can we start making ES cells along this neural tube, understand what the rules are as to how they differentiate, let them go in a dish, make a bloody mess in a dish, and use this mess to dissect out the circuit? Of course, there are several challenges. And 
Um, so again, just to repeat myself before I get to the challenges, I think the in vitro data set and the in vivo data set sort of complement each other. And I think we can go back and forth between them. And that gives us an enormous po powerful way of getting at what the cell types are and how they are created, I think. And I think the Allen Institute rightly should be focusing on questions like this because it gives us another way of coming at the cell types. But there are serious challenges, and this relates to some of the talks from yesterday. So here's a mess, right? Because we understand cell types, and this is a horrible looking something. Uh, people have measured expression patterns, exp measured binding sites of these transcription factors on the DNA, hooked them all up based on which proteins bind where, and that's one form of an answer. And you could say, I understand the circuit because this is the answer. But I'm telling you, I want to know which buttons I need to push in here to make the cell go this way or that way, right? And so I think we're getting it wrong. We're getting how we're looking at this data set wrong is my strong impression. If we look at it differently, maybe we can see the answer. And we've done some preliminary work, which is published already, to show that we can actually disentangle the circuit if we look at it right. And the immediate answer usually when you get this mess and you don't know what to do is to make even more measurements. And then you get more bigger mess. So the more measurements you make, the more nodes you get, the more links you get. And somehow this enormous number of measurements might cloud a simple answer. So it almost seems like a danger to make so many measurements because you can't see what's simple. And here is one example of a simple answer. Uh, oh, right, before I get there. So the question is, how do you look at this? And the naive way of looking at it is to do clustering analysis. And again, I can tell you, you can't predict which buttons to push to make the cells go one way or the other. The other one is to look at the dynamics. Dynamics is well and good. But it could be that it's a combinatorial set of factors that are governing this decision. So if you have 4,000 transcription factors and you had to tag three transcription factors in some combinatorial fashion, no matter how much resources and time you have, it's a horrible problem. So we somehow, even before measuring the dynamics, need to understand which buttons to push. So we don't have the option of looking at dynamics carefully, really, as we go along. So the question is, can we identify the circuits that make this decision and modulate the dynamics of the activity to control the choice? And here is one example of a decision, forget the signals, but here is an embryonic stem cell. The earliest decision it's making is to decide between the two germ layer fates. One is the mesendodermal germ layer, and the other is the neuroelectrodermal germ layer. We know a lot from the literature because we can isolate this cell type, we can isolate that cell type, that cell type, and get these horrible messes that I showed you on the last slide. But we know very little about how these cell types go from here to there, and what is the underlying circuit that's governing this transition. But I think if we just look at expression data and sort of exploit the fact that this underlying number of choices are not continuous but broken, and use the expression data and analyze it statistically with this underlying broken symmetry, if you like, the answers, at least for this transition, start looking very simple. And here's a paper based on the analysis. But what we do find is that this germ layer fate transition is determined only by three factors, which you would not have guessed if you naively looked at this. And we can modulate these three factors to force the cell to go one way or the other. And not only that, you can add the signal. So one thing I forgot to tell you, we know a lot about the red cell and the green cell. But once it turns red or green, the choice is already made. So what is making the choice happens before the cell turns red or green. And these three factors, we can look at the dynamics and really read the mind of the cell. Within an hour of adding the signal, we can tell you what the cell is thinking of doing, even before it commits to a decision. So suddenly, if you start thinking of cell types, and start doing microarrays, these answers look very, very complicated. But if you start thinking of what are the circuits making this choice, the answers look very simple. And I'm sure you're aware of all these reprogramming experiments. There are about eight examples, as far as I can tell so far. Each one of them involves three, four factors. And if you look at this bloody mess, there is no way. The only thing you might predict is that there is no way there are three or four factors that can do this. So I think. Rather than making measurements, we also need to be worrying about how do we look at this data to identify these few factors. And if indeed, at every step, it's these few factors, identifying and looking at the dynamics of these factors might be a good way of determining cell types, rather than looking at the final expression pattern. So in conclusion, I think we want to achieve enough understanding to control cell fate choice. And this is not only an engineering exercise, but I think it's a scientific exercise because we might be able to identify cell types this way. And I think we want to exploit both the in vivo data and the in vitro setup with the human ES cells that the Cell Networks Project is beginning with 
to put the two together and see what we can get out in terms of these circuits. And we really need to develop new computational and conceptual tools more than just naive computer science tools that just put everything together. And this is my bias. And I'm, as I said, I'm stepping out, uh, and I might be wrong. But, uh, and finally, as I said before, discovering the circuits that control differentiation might actually be easier than figuring out cell types, just because of the more and more examples coming up where you just have a few factors that determine how to move cells from one fate to another. And one other thing, which again, thanks to I don't have any data slides, but one other thing, once you discover these three factors, there are also evolutionary rela relationships between them. So we can find evolutionary relationships between the factors that make the initial decision versus the next decision and so on. So I think once we start discovering them, there might be rules that allow us to guess the next answers more and more easily. And I think it's a worthy enterprise to figure out if this answer is going to be easy or not and then just give up, but I think it's worth a try. I think that's about it. Thank you. <clears throat>